to the afternoon session of the Sysman Miniconf. Um, we're starting out with Stephen Sykes talking to us about an automated rollout of Linux with a Windows VM guest. And thanks for coming everyone. Um, I work at the University of Canterbury as you can see from up there. I've actually been in the computer science department for a little over two years having been elsewhere um, on campus and um, was fortunate to be able to slip into the role there. Um, what we had before I, um, before I got involved and started um, fiddling with things is um, Sorry, this is a 2009 netbook with an Atom N270, so this is probably a bit of hard work for it, but we'll see how we go. Um, we've got roughly 260 machines in our department um, across four labs. Um, this includes staff and postgraduates um, as well. Previously, we used um, Fedora Linux with Windows 7 in a dual boot um, configuration, and all Linux. Um, authentication account information came from our own department um, LDAP service. And why would we want to change anything? Well, no matter which way you spin it, your booting is a pain in the neck for anyone. It interrupts your workflow if you are somebody who needs to use both operating systems. You need to maybe plan ahead and then of course you've got to wait for your software to shut down, reboot, log in the other operating system, set yourself up and it's awful. And because of that, um, both Windows and Linux got behind on updates. Students could come into a lab, sit down um, at any particular machine, see it's not running the operating system they want. Yeah, they could restart the machine and pick the operating system they did want, but that hardly ever happened. They'd just move across the machine to, to something that already is running their operating system that they wanted to use. So this left us with a situation where um, the dormant operating system could go a very long time without getting any kind of updates um, or software that we wanted to push out. So when the dormant operating system became active because someone rebooted it and started it up, hello, and the machine got busy sucking everything in and this was kind of not a good look when um, if you've got a lab test going on and your machine's starting to um, get hammered because it's catching up because it's been weeks or possibly a month or two um, behind. Um, the other thing that made it tricky is um, the release schedule and the life cycle um, of Fedora. We would always go with the even numbered releases which gets releases you know towards the end of the year. Fedora 18 for example um, I think it was seven times its release date got pushed back and when you throw into the mix Christmas holidays and other people want to take a little bit of extended leave and you've got an academic year starting at the end of February, having things delayed until January-ish is um, a bit of a tense time for us, especially when um, some of the bleeding edge stuff that you see in Fedora it, it gets thrusted on you and you've got um, very little time to work out how to make this work on 260 odd machines. Um, I'm looking at you Gnome 3 and um, because the uh, life cycle of any given Fedora release is about 12 or so months when you've got things like shell shock and heart bleed um, the last thing you want to do is um, have machines which aren't getting updates anymore and so this is not kind of working for us. So I figured this could be better. We are a department who really love Linux, we use it a lot. Um, so I figured it was time to show it a bit more love. So I decided, well, all our hardware um, in our labs are all capable of virtualization and it's sitting there unused, so let's go for it, um, I decided. And I convinced everyone this was a good idea. So the other methods um, we considered the barebone system with a simple Linux underneath um, wasn't really going to work because you've got, if, even if you have a very simple Linux um, um, hosting operating system, that's another operating system you have to maintain. Um, this also doesn't work for us because we have courses where students need to create their own virtual machines. So you won't be creating virtual machines inside virtual machines because that just doesn't work thought about for like a millisecond of using Windows as the host operating system but the other requirement was that I needed this to work <laughs> and work reliably 
Um, if you've ever had the displeasure of using Microsoft's SCCM, the System Configuration, no, System Center Configuration Manager, um, as a colleague of mine accurately puts it, it's a great big hairy beast. And it's, um, we've observed that it's not predictable at when it actually pushes out software. You can install a machine, observe the order that software gets installed, reinstall the same machine, and it's in a different order. And our experience with Linux is that every time you say jump, it says how high. So um, obviously we're going to um, have Linux as the hosting operating system and addressing the issues that I described with Fedora, um, I said, hey, yes, let's use Linux Mint and we'll use a long-term support version because we get updates um, for five years. And we switch to um, the next long-term support version every two years. This is kind of good for us because at the end of the year, when summertime comes on and um, there's not so many students around, we've got a bit more time now that we can work on other summertime projects. And with the, the long-term um, support version being released early in the year, it's got time to mature, stabilize, and we can fiddle about with it and see what's going on and let it mature. So um, to have a machine set up, like we buy a bunch of machines and to shove this into our environment, um, the way I went about it, um, I didn't spend too long looking at um, other systems that other people had already possibly created because there was a risk of maybe it didn't quite do all the things I felt like it might wanted to do and the fact that I had the um, end of year in which to get this done by and we were also dealing with the fact that um, since you will have noticed from the very first slide, I'm from Earthquake City, we had building remediation going on as well, so whether or not we were actually going to get our labs back in time for the academic year was um, something else adding a little bit of pressure into the mix. So I thought, well, by the time I'd looked at everything else, I probably could have knocked something up um, which works. Fortunately, this does. So I have on a web server just a simple text file. Um, it, it is a CSV file, except everything is semicolon delimited because um, there is also information about um, where your Windows virtual machine sits in Active Directory and to make it easier in dealing with this information from the Windows side of things, the organizational unit has commas in it. So I've got to change my field separator. Our virtual machines are based upon the host name that the host operating system has, just so it's easy to tell them apart. And all the virtual machines have their own unique MAC address, and when I was making this up, I thought 10,000 MAC addresses seems like a good number. Um, they're all unique, um, and we're using VirtualBox as um, the hypervisor, and in my experience, I've noticed that all MAC addresses created by VirtualBox all start with, um, is it 08 colon 00 colon 27? So we've got another 16.7 MAC addresses we can use at the end of that. We're not likely to run out anytime soon. And so when we buy a group of machines to shove them into this system, um, we get that information as a CSV file. I just did a little Python program which pulls out the information we need, which contains the MAC address of the, um, the active interface we're going to use on the computer. And it's, um, we have an in-house asset I, um, ID system, and that makes up part of the host name. So it pulls all that, shoves it into this simple flat file database, and Bob's your uncle. And so from Linux, um, I modified the Ubuntu customization kit very, very slightly um, in that it doesn't actually build an ISO at all um, for Linux Mint because it looks up to see what distribution of uh, Ubuntu you're using um, and at that point it fails when you're trying to create your ISO so I just told it not to do that. The reason I'm making an, an ISO rather than say using Pixie Boot to do all this is because I can share it around um, other places on campus. There's a growing need for people who see Linux as a genuine need to have, not a I want it, it's I need it to do um, my stuff, primarily in postgraduate studies. So um, when I've knocked up my ISO and I write it on, I only need eight 
memory sticks because by the time I've done the eighth machine, the first one's finished. So I can just pull it out and keep going around. So um, when the machine um, sets up, it um, looks, grabs a copy of this file, looks at the MAC address of the active um, Ethernet device. Hey, there's my MAC address, there's my host name, names itself. Um, and then a post install script um, pretty much does everything else, um, as you can see up there. The important part of that is that each Linux machine joins Active Directory. We chuck all our machines into the same OU because they're not going to pay any attention to any Windows group policies or anything that might get applied. So um, it's not relevant. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now um, we've taken care of part of the LDAP issue um, earlier on whereby anybody who logs into a Linux machine, their password is always authenticated against Active Directory, but their account information still comes from our own LDAP servers. Uh, this is because the information we want in our LDAP servers, um, Central IT don't seem to be too keen on including. Having the passwords authenticated with AD is um, a big plus because previously we had been replicating our password information with Central IT and things could get a little bit out of sync. Now that problem goes away. So when you're making up a Windows um, VM, you need to use network bridging. If you don't, your machine will not join um, Active Directory and things just won't work. So you just create a virtual machine with VirtualBox um, and you allocate how much disk you feel like giving to your virtual machine, um, RAM and all that kind of stuff, chuck it in the domain and install all the Windows updates because that'll save time later on. Um, set aside two hours for the Windows updates alone, ask me how I know. And then you can chuck in your SCCM client and if you're not aware what you would use that for, it's um, basically Microsoft's way of getting your software um, these days onto Windows. When you've done that, just join it from the domain so it's in the work group and reboot it. And then you copy some key files into strategic places. The unattend.xml um, is an XML file created by the Windows Automated Installation Kit. Um, it's a free tool for Microsoft and there's various um, websites with, that will build you this file for you. Um, the PowerShell scripts and command scripts I refer to there um, are things that I wrote which basically replicate the same kind of function that Linux uses. Um, Windows will um, look at its MAC address that it's been assigned, look up that file, there's my name, and name itself, do a reboot, and then it will join um, your domain when you're actually deploying it. And when you've got those files in place, then you can run the sysprep utility, um, which will ready Windows so that after it's deployed, it will do the first time run on startup. And then you can export this whole thing as an, as an OVA. And when you actually deploy it, I took the approach of having a special user which is local to the machine and the Windows VM is run as this user. The last thing we want is anyone being able to start up the virtual box um, virtual machine manager and seeing the Windows VM there and thinking, ooh, I'll play with that and um, generally muck around and um, give you a bad day and break it for anyone else who wants to use it on that machine. So they don't see it at all. All they see is a .desktop file in their start, in the start menu. My goodness, what's happening to me? Um, on their desktop and also in the menu, they run that and boom, VM starts up and goes full screen. The, um, they can toggle out of that if they want to. And when the VM's imported, um, the bash script um, looks up the machine, the Linux machine that this is happening on and goes, well, okay, um, this virtual machine is to be allocated this particular MAC address and yanks it out and then configures the virtual machine so that it uses it. Um, then cron entries are created so that updates can occur um, at night time. So now we can up, um, apply updates and other software to Windows at night 
and we can still do Linux at the same time. So yes, in the wee small hours, Cron will start up the virtual machine headless. This is a feature in VirtualBox, and Windows will uh, do its first time run, and there is a path in Windows, C column backslash, Windows backslash, System32 backslash, I think it's set up complete. Any, fault, any CMD file you chuck in there, um, Windows will run. I believe it actually has to be called setupcomplete.cmd. And from there, you can launch your um, PowerShell scripts, which um, make all this work. And when you've got that set up, then your Windows guys can um, apply group policy, SCCM, anything they want to, because as far as AD and all that is concerned, it's just a real Windows machine. And at 5 a.m., it'll shut down. And this is something that happens every day, so any updates we want to do at any time, we can, and they'll happen at night time. So the result with this is that, well, it works. Um, students tended to, uh, as I said earlier, they would um, sit down at a machine, see it's not running the operating system that they wanted and move over. Now students don't even bother half the time starting up the virtual machine and they just use Linux, which is what I was going for in the first place. Um, so I think that's a win. And the exceptions there are that you need to still use um, Windows for Office and students who are doing computer vision tend to use um, an actual Windows machine box uh, rather than have it in the VM because VirtualBox does, or rather the other way around, the Microsoft SDK for the Xbox uh, camera does not work under VirtualBox, it does under VMware, but the reason I chose to do this in VirtualBox over VMware is because I wanted to not spend any money. And the licensing allows us to actually um, to do this. There's a, um, an add-on pack, an extension pack, where the licensing, because we're, a, we're an academic institution, and after having read the license from beginning to end in its entirety and understood it, I figured, yep, we can use this. Um, feedback's been quite positive from everybody um, without asking um, I had people coming to me and say, yep, this works for us. Um, so we've managed to nail, um, what is it? Um, birds with two, um, two birds with a stone. Um, so you, yeah, um, it works. And the other thing that um, we've managed to do using a similar kind of thing here is sl shameless plug given that we are hosted at the University of Auckland right now. Um, in the last year, the University of Canterbury um, was successful in having its introduction to programming course, the COSC 121, have all their students complete their final exam completely online. There was no paper-based exam anymore. And students walked out of the computer lab knowing what they scored in the exam, which uh, is a much more natural way to program than using um, pen and paper. And it's also easier for um, people to mark exams um, on a computer, even though this is actually automated, because if you've ever tried to read someone's code written on pen, it's really hard. Um, so that's all I really had to tell you. Um, all the Bash scripts and PowerShell stuff, um, if you're interested, um, I will be making available um, along with the slides here. So if it's something that you're keen to muck about with, then, um, then go for it, please. And, and no doubt there will be improvements, because I did say I did knock this up kind of over the summertime. Um, so things can always be improved. So if anyone's got anything they want to ask, now would be a good time. We've got about Hello. five minutes for questions. Just a um, quick, uh, quick query. You said you still needed to use MS Office. Is that mostly because the rest of the Sorry, uni... Sorry, I didn't catch the... You needed to use MS Office. You couldn't use LibreOffice, presumably. Is that oh, because yeah, of that, interactive... That is there anyway. Um, that's that definitely there, but I think most people are kind of wired into thinking, oh, I need to use a word processor, so I have to use MS Office. Right, so it's not actually a requirement because every other part of the uni is using stuff that 
doesn't migrate well to Libra, then it's just that yeah, it's, well, it's, um, we, we do have a course which does teach MS Office, um, but I mean the kind of principles that are taught in that can um, apply to um, to Libra Office anyway. Um, but this is, you know, this is a small part in the big picture, and you have to start somewhere with this. Yep. So it's more just the momentum yeah, at the moment yeah. rather than technical. Yes. Yep. yep. You mentioned AD before. Um, do you run? Sorry, I'm over here. Oh, there. <laughs> uh, you mentioned AD before. Um, do you do you run SAM before, or do you actually have a Microsoft AD controller that links into your LDAP backend? So I can't. I don't know if it's the audio, but I didn't quite catch all of that question. Yeah. So I was just asking if you use um, SAM before as your um, no, interface. No, no. That that's a, um, a Microsoft backend entirely. Um, but we use SSD to to join the domain, and this is this is a good thing because it means we don't have to ask IT on. Can you change this? Can you change that? In order for us to work with you, we can just simply um, using all the Linux tools we can slot in, and then we and then one day we can say, Hey, did you know we were doing this? And 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 they haven't had to um, make any changes to anything in their system, which is how I want it to be. But um, one thing at a time. Thanks. Hi there. What have you? Oh, up here, sorry. sorry. What have you done with your iMac lab? The have, iMac lab. Yeah. Have you got uh, Linux Mint running on that? No. no. Mac lab. Yeah, the Mac lab, which basically everyone was just running Windows on. We've got um, some labs have moved. Um, places because um, um, because of earthquakes and stuff, um, we have got some labs now which do have Macs and they are dual boot um, OS X um, and Windows. As to who uses which operating system, I don't know because that's on the other side of campus and I never go there. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Um, so, w with respect to your VMs, um, you, you've got these scripts that you run to set up the VMs. Um, there's a tool called uh, CloudBase in it from uh, this company, CloudBase, um, which is like a Windows provisioning tool um, to do exactly this. I didn't know if you'd heard about that or looked at that at all um, as a way to provision things uh, more automatically than what you've got. or. I've, I haven't come across it, sorry. Um, okay. um, I didn't look all that hard. Um, before, before I started this, I was sort of making it up in my head, thinking, oh, yeah, this could work, this could work, if we do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does seem to work. And the, the way that um, this works, uh, pushes out the, the Windows VM, um, also works for doing um, our virtual machine for uh, doing the online exam I was talking about, because that's all inside a Linux VM as well, which, um, which is locked down. So I did, um, what was good about that was that I could reuse code I'd already written, and I didn't need, need to completely re redo things. So it seemed like a natural, a natural thing to do at the time. Great, thank you. Please join me in thanking Stephen.